Welcome back to another episode of Gumball Love. I'm your host, Melissa Ledger, soon to be Melissa Roberts. It is down to 88 days, I believe, until my wedding day, and I cannot believe this is happening. It's still surreal to me. And so I just wanted to tell you, I'm a little guilty of probably not talking to you guys enough about what's going on with me. And I have a wonderful new coach who said, you know, your content's a little cold. There's not enough Melissa in your content. So I apologize for that because I am a kind of a research geek when it comes to gumball love. And I'm always into what is going on and what are the red flags and how can I help you avoid this guy and find love yourself. And after finding love myself, I'm even more inspired to help you avoid all of the things that I wish someone would have been telling me. And so I'm actually going to be launching a webinar, and you'll be hearing uh, about this very soon, that is going to be how to find the one and the top, I haven't narrowed down the number, I think it's going to be the top seven things, could be more, the top seven things, or 10, whichever, I wish I would have known, the changes I wish I would have made, what I could, what I would tell my single self all those years ago when I was losing the faith and feeling like it was never going to happen. In fact, in our weekly group call, we talked about all the different things that we're afraid of. Like, you know, is this just going to be what I am? Am I just going to be a single girl forever? And, you know, I haven't even had a kiss for how many weeks, months, maybe it's been years. And as we sometimes the longer we go without being with someone, or we're with so many guys, we're dating so many, and those aren't working out. So it's like we're either feast or famine. And when either side isn't working, it just feels so frustrating. Like, what am I doing wrong? And that's always the go to question that I teach all of my clients to veer away from like, what what is wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? It's usually never the case. And So if you are at this point, I'm just going to always open this up. I'm doing a three-month program called Level Up for Love, and I really teach you how to up-level your mindset and your lifestyle so that you are ready for the right person. And there's so many things that are just not being taught. There's so many things that are just not being said. There's this idea you can manifest the guy. There's this idea that you can, you know, call him into your life and Yes, that can happen and it does happen for people. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I think that sells you short on so many other things you could be empowering yourself and learning about. So you know, I I want you to sit with confidence that and you're on a date with a guy, you know he's not the right guy for you. You know that you, you can see, yep, we have chemistry, but normally, th- this is what my client goes through. We have chemistry and normally I would have dated this guy but I am going to delete him and block him when I leave this date because I know with certainty, this is not the right guy. This is the one I have to walk away from. And old me would have probably gone on four more dates with this guy. And now I'm getting all that time back. So imagine just being able to tweak your systems a little bit to be able to have a different lens. And this is what I hope all of the free content that I give you in this podcast and in all of the posts, please know every single post, every single effort is so thought through of how to help you shorten this window of agony that we go through before we meet the one, okay? So I wanted to share kind of a a different perspective because I came across this kind of a scary article of why marriages fail. In fact, this is on brides.com, written by Leah Rose Emery, fact-checked by Sharice Harris. Interesting, I've never seen the fact-checked. She wrote this on June 13th, 2021. And it says, the first year of marriage is the hardest. And it says, it's the hardest even after you've lived together. Was my first thought was, well, we've lived together. So, and it said that that first year of someone being all up in your space, but why is it even harder after marriage? Even if you've had, you know, some people think living together is the trial. But when there's a lead up to a wedding like I'm having right now, and it's, oh my gosh, it's the end of July and I'm going to get married. And it says here in this article that even if you had an amazing wedding and tons of fun planning it, life after the big day can still be tricky because suddenly 
it's over. There is There can also be a bit of an anti-climax post-wedding. People who have been working toward this goal for a year or two, and it's over in one night. Okay, so this I know with certainty will not happen to me because in fact, we just got done talking. We had dinner and I was like, all right, I have to go record a podcast and he's doing work. And actually when I was talking to my weekly group call, I said, you know, when I get off of this call with you guys, I know I have somebody that I can go talk to and I know I can talk to him for the rest of my life. And I, we will never run out of content. We will never run out of things to talk about. And I've never had that with anyone. And this is something that I'm asking all of my clients to think about is what do you want to talk to your spouse about? You know, we're so caught up in all these ideas about marriage and engagement and weddings and the the honeymoon and the infatuation period and falling in love and being this wonderful power couple. But what does it actually look like? What does it sound like? What does it act like? And I'm talking about not only you as a couple, but also him. Like, how do you know when you've met the one? I mean, people ask this question a lot. Like, how do you know when you've met the one? I think it's really hard when you don't really know what you're looking for. It can feel like the one when you haven't been with somebody for a long time, you haven't been kissed, you haven't been on a date, you've been on a lot of dates with no chemistry. And then all of a sudden, bam, somebody stands out. Somebody's different. And it really sweeps you off your feet. You can't think of anything else but this guy. It's like, oh my gosh, he's so amazing. And every single text is just like, it sends this thrill through your whole body. And you look so forward to seeing him again. And it's, everything is intense, right? Because why? And this is what we really get to the heart of in coaching, because if you and I meet and we we start working together, we dig into this of what happened with that guy that it was so intense and it fizzled out? Like, what, what did I see? What did I not see that made me think that there was something there? And then what if you're like me and you get all the way to planning this big wedding? We're having a huge wedding. There's going to be a band. There's going to be a DJ and flowers and this beautiful location at a vineyard. And it's all wonderful. But what you know, what we're actually looking the most forward to is our honeymoon spot, which I'll tell you guys when uh, we're ready to, but we're talking about what we're going to do on our honeymoon and where we're going to be. And you guys will understand why I'm using this as an example. But it's the life, the, the person I want to talk to about everyday life, I know with certainty that I am not holding this wedding as some big lead up to it's like, Yes, it was fun and it's beautiful and I'm so glad we're doing it and I I am looking so forward to it. But I know I'm with the right person because I'm not putting intensity around the wedding day, if that makes sense. And so I want you to think about what would it take to meet somebody where the intensity is not on the wedding, the engagement, the milestones, Because we see these milestones in highlight reels and we associate a false story. We see a, you see a girl like me, I'm engaged. And yes, we got engaged in an island all to ourselves. Ian took me there on a boat and it was wonderful. But is that our life every single day? No. And it would be really exhausting if it was, right? I mean, it's wonderful to have those moments, but you have to have a home base to come back to. You have to have a normal, you have to have the, it's like, you can't have a diet that's all dessert. You have to have meals that are, that, that have substance, that give you energy and, and allow you to do all the things you do and work out and go to work and stay up late or, you know, all, whatever, go dancing. Like we we have to give ourselves good nourishment in order to have energy. And when we don't and we're eating too much sugar, we get sick, right? Because it's, it's not a balance. And so what I wanted to share with you, and this was the hot tip that I gave my girls in my weekly group coaching. So if you want to join just the group and you want to be in on all this girl talk, I'm telling you what, this group of girls is amazing. They are doing the work. They are digging in. And these conversations are getting 
really advanced. And I'm telling you what, I'm so excited for so many of them is they have no idea the perspective they're gaining and how much progress they're making and how much easier the search for love is becoming because they're getting so much clarity. And if you can get this clarity and you understand who you are and you understand what you're looking for, you will also know that you'll know when you've met the one. And and this is where you won't be relying on chemistry to say, oh, yes, oh my gosh, I had, because, you know, Ian and I had that great moment of connection in the beginning, but I knew nothing about him. So yes, we had chemistry, but our relationship could not have sustained based on our first date in New York City and the chemistry and the sparks that were flying. What sustains us is our friendship. What sustains us is every single day showing up for each other and being willing to contribute. It's constant. When people would say marriage is a lot of work or relationships are a lot of work, it always bothered me because it was like, why does it have to sound like so much work? Like, what does that even mean? I don't get it. And it's work in that you show up, you know, when you work for yourself, you show up and you eat right, you show up and you exercise, you show up and you do your job and you make sure you do things on time and you that's doing the work, right? And it's not bad. It's just what you have to do. You have to do work because you have to pay the bills. And so if you want to sustain a relationship, you have to be there for each other. You have to keep an eye on how the other person's doing. Like tonight, Ian went and got me dinner and I get downstairs and it's already plated for me. And he's because he knows I'm doing my weekly calls. I'm with my girls. I'm coaching at night. And, you know, we're building this empire together. And so he's always there to contribute to me. And then when it's my turn, I'm there to contribute to him. And then we come together every night and we talk about our day. We drink tea. (laughs) He brings, makes me tea every night in bed. It's so amazing. We sit and we drink tea and we have, you know, we talk about what, you know, what's going on at work. And there's just constant contribution to each other's lives and listening and being there for each other. And so how do you know if you found the one? Chemistry is not your main indicator. Chemistry is your indication of I'm physically attracted. I'm sexually attracted to this person. Maybe we would have cute babies, but everybody you would have cute babies with is not the one. You can have cute babies with a lot of people. You can have chemistry with thousands of people. But if you are of the mindset that there's got to be more to it than this, and I need to know more about this person before I make that declaration or I jump to this grand conclusion after one or two dates, because what you do is then you set yourself up for a fantasy that you wait to see happen and man, you're then you're waiting for the fantasy to manifest. So it's chemistry with the hope of a fantasy manifestation. And when that doesn't happen, and there's such a high hope of that coming true, and you're imagining it, and looking at their pictures from their profile and looking at their life and their family or their friends or whatever, you know how you do it, you go and you look at the profile pictures and you picture him with you and going to some of those same places or traveling, like you start, you start creating this whole life that you would have with this guy. And like I said, when that doesn't come true, or you start to see red flags, or he pulls away, or he's now not texting for hours or a couple of days, and he's giving you the, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, work's really busy right now. But there you are, back still focused on the fantasy. And so sometimes it's like we we can't we can't stop doing that. So we continue to do it and and we don't even hear that he's that he is pulling away. We make up excuses for it because we're so married to the fantasy that we really, I mean if you think about this, I've really next, actually never said this before, but when you think about when you put so much intensity around those first dates, you really are meditating on that reality. So it becomes real in your mind. It becomes your meditation. One of my girls said in the group, it's you, you start daydreaming 
And when you start daydreaming, you get tunnel vision. She said it so perfectly. You're daydreaming, you get tunnel vision, and then you start committing to the fantasy that may or may not come true. And it's also your own creation, right? So this the guy isn't even involved in the fantasy. He's just sending you, like, really look at what did I have to go off of when I created this fantasy? Did I have one date? Did I have two? Is he texting, but he still hasn't asked me out yet? He sent me enough information where he's so cute and he's so this and he's so that, that I just feel, sometimes I'd be like, I just feel like he's the one. I just have such a strong feeling about this. I can't even tell you how many times I thought that. And I've said that. And he wasn't the one. There were, you know, I could think of, I don't know, maybe a dozen where I would get these strong feelings about them. And I would think about them all the time and wonder. And then any message seemed like, oh my gosh, he's thinking you know, the guy that has been ignoring you for like three or four days or two weeks, like the guy that you keep thinking about and you're like, I don't know, I'll just like give up. And then all of a sudden there he would be. (gasps) He was thinking about me. See, there was something. And now every fantasy I had that I had maybe even let go of for a few days, bam, all of it would come back and I'd refixate on it. So you start fixating on it, you meditate on it, and it becomes so real in your mind. And when it doesn't come true, you're so devastated, all because of this creation you made in your mind that is now. So it's like you gave yourself a gift and you took the gift away. You really are in control. You just don't realize that you're in control and you don't realize what is overpowering you to have this mindset. And this is what we work on in coaching. I can teach you what is creating this pattern to have a go-to fantasy. what? Why are we creating this fantasy? What is the driver behind it? And how do you stop that cycle? So that's a cycle in and of itself. There's also the cycle of really understanding the gumball guy. What does he want? What does he? Sh- how does he show up in the very beginning? What are the first texts of a gumball guy that get you addicted to hearing more, to wanting him, to yearning for him to get you obsessing over him. How does he do it? This drove me crazy. I had to know. I was like, all this stuff, this clickbait stuff, like how to get your guy, how to get him to fall for you, what men want, do these things. I used to study that stuff. And then I would see it work for a while. But then it was like, okay, what happens when that doesn't work? I would just see too many instances where it doesn't work. And so then I would start to think, okay, well, this this can't be it. And then married people never play. If you have to ask married people, I've said this a million times, like people that are actually getting married or are married. If you ask them, did you play games with each other before you got married? When you were dating, did you guys play a lot of games and like hide and seek, cat and mouse, like didn't call or text back for three days, blah, blah, blah. Like you text me, message me and say, Melissa, I found somebody who played games and they're happily married. I'll give you, I'll give you a gift card if you can find that and prove it to me. It just doesn't exist. I mean, sure. I'm sure there's an exception somewhere out there, but like really the majority, they're not playing games. So then that would drive me nuts. Well, if the people that have the success are not playing games, then how does it actually work? What do the people that have the end result, what do they do differently? First and foremost, time frame. Happy couples, typically, and I want you to test me on this. Ask a happy couple when they met their future husband or wife. Were they in a hurry to get married or to find their significant other? I want to, let's do a little field research because what I see in a lot of my clients, and this might be you, is you feel like you're running out of time and that sense of urgency is making you make bad decisions and it's hard to stop this feeling because you're like, Melissa, how can I not be urgent? I'm getting older. I want to have kids. Everybody's worried about their eggs. And, you know, having that family and crossing off all those boxes. And so every day that you don't find the one, you feel a sense of urgency. 
And what I teach you in coaching is how to deal with that. How can you date without that sense of urgency? It's the most critical thing you you need to master because urgency, just think of it, it's like you're starving. You're starving and so you eat things that aren't good for you when you're hungry and whatever is quick, like there's nothing better than, you know, if you're starving and you just eat popcorn, if you eat too much popcorn, you feel sick because it's not substantial. It's not going to give you sustainable energy, but it will taste so good when you're starving. You could just eat so much. You can eat a bag of chips. You could eat a whole bunch of ice cream because you're starving because there's a sense of urgency. You go to the grocery store and there's all this food to make meals, but you're starving to death. So you're you're picking up something you can just open a package and eat it right now. And that's what dating's like when we're urgently looking. We're like, oh, this guy's here and well, he's nice and you know, nobody's perfect. And, you know, I mean, like he's he's got this thing and that thing and and I see that, but you know, what about this and this? And yeah, I mean, I just want to give him a chance and you know, like and then you start getting defensive and you feel like you have to defend this guy because you see red flags, but you're looking at your clock. I gotta get this done. What if I what if I keep waiting and I don't meet him. Like, what's going to happen? Am I going to be single forever? You know, like this is this is not going to work. And then you go into your freak out mode. We talked about this in the group tonight as well. And by the way, when you're in our group, we go in depth in this. Like we go in depth about the urgency. We go in depth about how it feels when combine urgency with not having had affection for a long time. Or maybe you've had too many one night stands and you feel like, I mean, am I ever going to have more than this? If you're starved for that true intimacy, can you recognize it when it shows up in your real life? Like this is, this is the thing that I, I know that there's a timeline that you're chasing, but also are you worried about if you have this sense of urgency, you're going to miss it anyway, because you're going to miss, you're not going to know how to see the good guy if you keep chasing the bad ones, right? This is like my whole message in a summary. So it's just going to take you so much longer. And I, and I don't I don't know that I believe there's just one out there. I think you can miss opportunities, but there will always be new opportunities. But the question is, how long do you want this to take? You know what I mean? Most of us are like, all right, let's wrap this up here. Um, I, I really don't want to be on Hinge or, you know, uh, Match.com or, you know, eHarmony, whatever you, you just, the idea of creating a dating profile makes you want to throw up. You're like, I don't want to do this anymore. So if you don't want to do it anymore, then the, it's like, it's like a catch 22. Like, I don't want to do this anymore, but I can't hurry. And that is the toughest thing. You can't be in a rush because if you're in a rush, you're going to miss, just think if you're rushing around, what happens? You forget stuff, right? You, you rush around the house and you're in a hurry. You forget your keys. You forget your phone. Oh my God, I left my per- oh, my wallet to my other purse. I switched my purse out. Like being in a rush is never a good way to make good decisions. So how do you approach this in a way that allows you to be precise? So you can be on purpose with precision and let go of the urgency so I'm going to teach you how to, let's, let's go approach the dating world with precision and purpose where we know exactly what we're looking for. And right away, doesn't that feel good? Like, okay, what if I, if I don't feel like I have to talk to everybody and it does feel, okay, Melissa, you're telling me I can't be in a hurry. I get it, but I still feel like anxiety around that. And and I haven't had affection for a really long time. And so I'm already worried that the first guy that like wants to make out with me is going to make me lose my mind. And I haven't had a guy like say anything nice to me or do something nice to me for me in like so long that I just feel like, you know, how can I have these high expectations when I don't, I feel like it's so hard for me to even find one good guy. You know, it's a really difficult thing to wrap your mind around because you've been in this pattern for so long. You've been in a hurry. You've allowed that guy that, oh my gosh, he's holding my hand. He's he's touching my face. Oh my gosh, he's kissing me. These things can carry so much intensity and so much power in them. And we miss the fact that he came on way too strong in the beginning. And although that felt good, 
it's not it's not a good sign that he was basically treating you like a girlfriend within the first two hours, or he's already showing you affection at your first dinner. But when we're starving, we miss the flags because we're so intent on it happening soon. And it looks like, oh my gosh, this has to be the one, right? When it, when it all comes together and that chemistry flows, it's like, this has to be it. So I'm, I'm trying to break up your relationship with the idea that that experience means it's the one. So just as kind of a recap, think about people that are married. Were they in a hurry when they met? And had they gone a long time without affection and all of a sudden that person showing them affection was a huge deal? I just want you to test this out and just who do you know that you can ask these questions, okay? Because a lot of times what you'll find is that that phrase, love comes when you least expect it, I believe that's because it's people that are not focused on that being the end all be all of their happiness. That yes, finding somebody is wonderful, but if you don't make them the end all be all of your all of your happiness, then if your relationship ebbs and flows or goes up and down, it's not going to it's not going to wreck you or make you think of divorce. When I when I pulled up this this article about you know, how marriage really, the first year of marriage is the hardest. It's the hardest because reality is hitting them for the first time. And I think this is why half of them end up in divorce because I'm so excited. We have all this chemistry. I'm ignoring the fact that we're not 100% compatible and we've gone on some dates and maybe you've dated for a year and there's a lot of excitement that can even happen in the first year. And there are things that can, that can, you know, you are compatible. You do have some things that are sustaining you, but is it enough for a marriage? And a lot of people don't really know what that looks like. I'm going to give you my biggest hack that I gave my group call tonight. Read books about what makes a marriage work. If you really want dating advice, look at what married couples really struggle with. And that's how you'll know if you're compatible on dates. I mean, the number one thing people fight about is money. So when you're on dates, you're not necessarily, you know, you're not the gold digger, but you want to look for, is this person in the same mindset around money or would could we end up fighting about that? Let's just say you kept that in the back of your mind. And then when the first date, he doesn't pay. It's like, there's your first fight about money. But but we overlook that. And we're like, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's just this. But we make all the excuses when actually you want a guy that pays. So right away, there's a different opinion about money. There's a different opinion about values, how men should treat women. Like, you know, everybody can have this debate, but it doesn't really matter what everyone thinks. It matters what you think. It matters what kind of guy you want. So everybody can say men should do this, women should do this, but there are men out there that say the man should pay and women are married to that man. And that is just how it is. And it may be unfair and it might be, you know, we it might be 2022, but it just is what it is. So you know, and the other, th- what else do people fight about? Let's just, let's just dig into some of these key things. And I'm not going to, this is a whole other podcast, but this is also in brides.com, most common marriage problems experienced by couples. And this is by Sarah Zlotnick. This was January 6, 2021. And her Number one is you don't take an interest in each other's interests. It starts with the best intentions. You want your partner to be independent and pursue their passions, even if you don't quite understand them. At the same time, you don't want to overly burden your partner with the things you love and they don't. While these sentiments come from a good place, they can create distance in a marriage. If we allow too much individuality, we end up in silos. Then we're just kind of living parallel lives instead of weaving a life together. This can lead to a loss of intimacy and interconnectedness that is crucial for a healthy relationship. So just that little pit, tidbit right there, it's like, okay, so yes, you you need to be independent, hold your own weight, just like we talked about in the last podcast. But if you're so different, if you're, is your lifestyle really that compatible with this person? Are you the homebody and he's the guy that wants to be out all the time? How does that work? You know, it's it's going to be something you fight about. If you watched Love is Blind, 
there was one guy on there that he went out all the time and it was really an issue. And they, at the one year follow up, she was like, man, this has been a challenge. They, you know, they're, they're working on it, you know, and they put on a nice outfit and showed up for the recording of that episode, but you could just see it on her face. This sucks. This is hard. And, you know, maybe she still feels like she made the right decision, but allow, allow the, the people that are, that are putting this on display for you, let them help you so you don't make the same mistake, you know? Uh, again, spending habits. So money becomes really important or falling out of sync when it comes to intimacy and sex or uh, jealousy or you're growing in different directions. When you spend some time around somebody and, you know, are they into personal development like you are? You're listening to a podcast right now. Do they listen to podcasts? Are they interested in any of those things? Like, Do you have enough common threads that can keep you coming together and talking about things that you're both interested in and you both enjoy. So I want to just expand your mind a little bit and say, okay, when I'm on a date and I'm feeling all lovey-dovey and schmoopy-schmoopy, that's great. But like, what are you actually talking about on the date? I mean, even even when I've explained Ian's in my first date a million times, but we talked a lot on our first date about art. We talked about his experiences in college. I remember uh, he told me about a business idea that he had that was really cool. And and I still remember. And I thought, man, that is a, an amazing idea. And then we talked about the show Scandal. And we talked about our favorite characters and what kind of actors we thought were really just incredible. Like the guy that plays Cyrus Bean. I was like, that is, he is one of the best actors I've ever seen. He's just like owns that character. And he's like, oh my gosh, totally. So when we talked about, we were able to talk on that first date, it was all right there. We were able to talk about business. We were talking about a, t- then a television show, which is completely different. We talked about art that we liked. We talked about family, where we're from. So there was a whole multitude of conversations that happened. And then when we talk on the phone, it was anything from a Star Trek episode to what was going on in the news to any number of things. And we were able to build a connection off of common interests. And when we reconnected, it was it was so amplified even more. And if you want to know the details of that, go to podcast number 111. You can see why we met. And then we, we were apart for five years. Then we came back. We never really had a full-blown relationship. But I just remember in, in the beginning, we went on like three dates and chatted for a few months, but it, he was leaving the country. It wasn't the right time. It was very confusing for me because I had all these feelings, but I let it go, guys. I didn't pine for him for five years. I completely thought, you know, I don't know what happened there, but I'm going on with my life. So although we did reconnect, it wasn't somebody I was sitting there waiting and hoping and creating fantasies in my mind about. When he reached out to me, I thought, oh, wow, Robert's interesting. Hmm. Let me see if I can, at that point, I was like, let me see what I can do to scare him off. I'm going to see what I can, I'm going to test, I'm going to test him because I was a whole different girl five years later. And I want you to come to dates with a little bit of moxie, a little bit of, you know, sit up straight and, and know who you are. And this is really where I work with my clients. I'm going to really just help you see who you are, help you see how much power you actually have just like Dorothy on The Wizard of Oz. You had the power all along. You really do. You're already enough right now. You just don't know your value yet. So this is why my motto is stop the cycle, discover your worth, find true love. We have to stop the cycle. And we have to stop being so infatuated by the fantasy of it all, because that is what is keeping you from experiencing the real thing. So if you're in a hurry, you got to slow down. You got to be more on purpose. You have to do this with more precision. You have to get even more picky or you have to get picky for the first time in your life because this is the most important relationship you will ever choose for your life. If this is a person you're going to make children with, I mean, does it get any more important than that? The person you're going to, and even if you have children, that's what, 18 to 20 years and then the rest of it is just with you guys again. I just told my girls, my therapist told me, He had a name for this. I have to ask him of women who get married, have kids, and then after the kids are grown, they get divorced. And then they have this sort of like a midlife crisis, but they realize I was just in this marriage for the kids. 
and their whole lives became focused on the kids because they didn't really have the intimacy, the friendship, the connection, and the things that they needed to sustain beyond when, when the kids were gone, there was nothing left for them. So, you know, and the next thing on this list of why marriages don't last is you're bored. And it said it can be a silent relationship uh, killer. What do you do when there's no discernible problem? You've both lost perspective on what makes your bond special. Boredom typically manifests in lack of enthusiasm, and it can take its toll on a marriage when left unchecked. So these are just little snippets. So I encourage you when you're looking up dating advice, look up the stuff that breaks up marriages and reverse engineer it because it's what makes amazing marriages too. When you know how to stay in sync with your intimacy, when you know what to look for, when you know what is going to make it compatible for you long-term, it becomes much easier on dates because you're like, I I know I, I like this guy, but I'm now armed with the information I need to know that this is not going to work long term. And I'm going to be one of those people getting divorced after I've just spent $40,000 on a wedding. You know, you don't want to be in that boat. There's so many, you know, 50% are in that boat. It's tragic. And there's all this information out here of what to do, how to avoid these things. But why do we not listen? Because we're in a damn hurry. And I hope I can inspire you and, and help you in the same way that when I walk down the aisle on July 30th, I will be a 45-year-old bride. I'm 45 right now. And did I want it to take till I was 45? No. Is it, it's totally was supposed to be my journey, but it's also my mission. God gave me this journey so I could turn around and teach you how to take years off of the struggle for you. So I didn't settle. I told you from day one, if you followed me for years, I would not settle. I would never get married to somebody because I made my single life freaking great. I know how to make Melissa happy. I know how to take Melissa on dates. I am completely happy with my alone time. You can leave me alone with books and an internet connection and some coffee and some dogs and some dance lessons. And like, I mean, I know I can keep myself happy for years because I figured all of that stuff out. And so when you have that, you're not, you're not in a hurry. You, you don't have those, that desperate need to fill it because you know, only the right person is going to add to it, not make it full. Like they don't complete you. You are a complete person. They are a complete person and you come together with two complete lives. So we are not missing this piece with this other person. But when you come together, yes, you are stronger. Yes, the two become one, but it's one and one become one. You know what I mean? Like you're two individuals and I want you to understand that you are such an important person. Your life means something. Your purpose means something. You are not here to just be married to someone and have kids with someone. You're not just somebody's wife and somebody's mom. You are you on your own. You have your own life's purpose. You have your own dreams, your own desires, your own interests. All of those things should not get go overlooked because trust me, there are a lot of women that are dead and buried that never had their own life, that lived for their husbands and lived for their kids. And they were buried and they had nice obituaries that said almost nothing about them as an individual because they hid or not even hid, they just faded into the background serving everyone else. And it's a wonderful service to others. But I know a couple of those women, they were my grandmothers. And I just wish people took more time to know who she, who was she really? What did she, you know, I look at both my grandmas and I'm thinking, what did they dream about? What do they really want? They had gumball guide husbands. No one heard their voices. And it's tragic because I didn't really hear, what, where did grandma want to travel? What did she want to do? Every time, you know, one thing in one grandma, every time she tried to talk, my grandpa would talk over her. And then she just would, finally, my sweet little grandma would just sit there quiet and not really say much. Would you want something to drink? Do you need, do you want some cake? 
you know, it's like, and, and such a beautiful, wonderful spirit that I, I know this is my mother's mother I'm speaking of. I know that this is where so much of my ability to love and warmth came from her because she was such a loving, nurturing person. But, you know, if I could go back in time, I would ask her more questions like, Grandma, what do you dream about? Where do you want to go? You know, what are your favorite TV shows? Or she did Love Young and the Restless. I didn't know that. <laughs> Actually, I didn't know her favorite t- TV shows. She watched the Grand Old Opry. But I wonder, did she watch it because my grandpa watched it? Or did she watch it because she really liked it? You know, like her story, as she called it, was the Young and the Restless. But like, what else was there that was really hers? You know, I can think of a few things, but you know what I'm saying? So I hope this inspires you to be a little less urgent about finding the guy and be more urgent about finding you, connecting with you, what you really want, what you really need, and not to get so hopeless about it, that it's so far away, that it's never going to happen, that, oh my gosh, I can't have all these high expectations because I'm never going to find anybody. Let's take away some of that sadness and hopelessness and replace it with some faith. Faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of what you do not see. And I told my girls tonight, I'm going to tell you this, I want you to walk away from this podcast with the certainty that you believe in a God that brings you the love of your life. And he's not going to bring it in a guy that can't text you back and ghosts you and then comes back and creates complications that make it painful for you. That's not what God brings to you. When God brings him to you, it's simple. That's like the the J-Lo song, it's simple when it's right. And although (laughs) J-Lo... It's like, sorry, I had to laugh. Maybe she's got it right this time at husband number five. But can you imagine trying to find a husband being J-Lo and all the complexities of being such a major celebrity? It's a whole other podcast in and of itself. But I just, I, I love that song by her. It's simple when it's right. And so I want you to have faith in that and say, well, how different would I be if I said, I'm, he's coming. I know it. And as I prayed, I think what I did before, this is one thing that I'll give you as a sneak peek to my webinar. One thing I started doing that made me realize Ian was real is I started to pray for him. And actually, I started lighting candles in church for him going back to 2002. I would light two candles, one for me, one for my future husband. And that is the church we're going to get married. And I told him there was a little corner that I lit a candle for you every Sunday. And so start praying for her your future husband, and expect God to bring him to you because he's a big God. He can handle, he can handle your requests. He's not like, oh man, I don't, I don't know if I can find anybody. (laughs) It's God. He's got it. So ask him and then believe it. And then understand that he doesn't work by your timing. There's one of my favorite scriptures. It's Isaiah 55, I believe. I have to look at the exact. Uh, I think it's Isaiah in chapter 55. For my no- thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God doesn't think like you, but he does know your heart and he does know how you feel. He knows how much you want it. However, you have to trust him with his timing. So I looked it up. It's Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. So I'm going to leave you on that note. Remember, let the spirit of adventure set the tone. Go on the adventure. Enjoy the journey. And know that the journey is not just about him. It's about you too. And you deserve to fulfill your own purpose and and have your own life and your own identity. And the right person will meet the real you and fall in love with all of you, all the weird things, all the beautiful things, all the things you never thought somebody would love about you. You will just be amazed at how worth it the wait really is. All right, my love, until next time, I'll see you soon. 